Hello everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be chapter 4 of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet of the Old Testament. They are considered the one of the minor prophets, not because of the importance of the message, but rather because of the size of the book. Uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, they were rather large. I don't know why they call Zechariah minor prophet, because it's 14 chapters, although some of the chapters are rather small. So uh, we're going to cover a lot of material and I guess we should get started, huh? All right, Zechariah chapter 4. And uh, I used to get Zechariah and Zephaniah mixed up. Well, Zechariah is Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. -H. So, chapter 4, verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. You ever been woken up out of a dead sleep? You know, takes, you're like, whoa, dude, what's going on here? You know, half asleep, you know. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, a candlestick, we're going to go into the candlestick, Behold a candlestick, all of gold. Now, gold is an interesting study in and of itself. With a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Now, there is, this candlestick is described in other places. It's got a large central stem, and then it's got three branches on one side and three branches on the others. Um, the uh, you-know-whos try to claim it as being the menorah. Might be true, maybe not, I don't know, I haven't looked it up. But let's take a look at the candlestick and let's go take a look at gold. So let's get started here. All right, what's neat about the King James Bible is that the most, well, I don't know about most, many times, I guess you could say, it's, if you were looking at a word or a phrase, the first time it appears, usually in the context, you can figure out what it's in reference to. So if you read something in the New Testament, you just, you're like, what is that talking about? You look up the word or the phrase, go back to the Old Testament, the first time that it appears, and generally it'll give you an idea of what's going on. All right, where is the first time that the word candlestick appears? Well, Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus. Exodus. Um, Israel left Egypt. They went out into the wilderness. And God's telling them to build the tabernacle so that he could be properly approached and worshipped. And in Exodus 25, 31. Now this was the job of the Levites. They were the tribe that was to serve the Lord. There were 12 tribes. And everybody wants you to think that all the tribes are the... Uh, well, it rhymes with the news, and it starts with a J. They want you to think all 12 tribes is just a, a few million of them over in the Middle East. I don't think so. All right, Exodus 25, 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Now, we're going to cover why gold. Gold, silver, iron, clay, 
um, certain uh, certain metals and colors and numbers they have associated with meanings in the Bible. You know that's why when people tell me that the Bible was just a man written book, impossible, impossible. It's just it's like a cloth, one string, one piece of thread lines up with the others, and it just goes off in all different kinds of directions. Um, I mean, I learn a lot doing these Bible studies, doing the research. I, I learn a lot. I mean, I, I it's amazing. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Huh. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in each branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. Uh, okay, I think we should uh, go on. Now, somebody um, made a book. I used to have it. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Seeing Christ in the Tabernacle. It was sold by a company called Choice Books. You'll see their Bible-related books in places like airports. And the book mentioned that the way the furniture was set up in the tabernacle, it was made up in the image of a cross. <laughs> I found that very interesting. When you look at it, how it's set up, I mean, how many people study the book of Leviticus that detailed? But the, the way the furniture was set up, it was, in, it was in the shape of a cross. Gee, just a coincidence, right? But... Um, I lost the book or gave it away or whatever, or somebody stole it or I don't know, lent it to somebody. I have read so many books over the last 30 years. I can't even remember maybe 15, 20% of them, but um, I do remember that. That was pretty in intense. All right. Now, just a little hint here. Uh, gold is... From what I understand, and I don't claim to have all understanding, but as I understand it, gold is the uh, color and metal representing God, God, the Lord. I mean, think of it, G-O-L-D. G-O, remove the L, and you got G-O-D, right? So... All right, let's go to take a look at some stuff about candlesticks. Now, in Matthew 5 and verse 13, Jesus speaking, he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And he says, now Jesus is the light of the world, but he says, ye are the light of the world. See, if we're his followers, we're supposed to be the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Well, unless you want to start a fire, right? But that's not what it's talking about here. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, so what's up with these uh, candlesticks? You know, well, Jesus said uh, he's the light of the world. 
And if we're in him, we are the light of the world. But what's up with these candlesticks? You know, you're talking in the book of Exodus where the tabernacle, where God was to be worshipped, but uh, that was just a foreshadow of Christ coming. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 1. This is the instance where the New Testament explains the Old Testament. A lot of times the Old Testament explains the New Testament. But in this instance, the book of Revelation sheds light on the Old Testament. And uh, yeah, I just recently blocked somebody that was commenting on my channel said that the book of Revelation was a fake. No, you're the fake, uh, the one that got blocked. So, I mean, really, you know, these, I'm, I'm so sick of these goats. I must have blocked a thousand people over the last 10 years that I've been on YouTube. All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know what revelation means? It means to reveal. That's what it means. It means to be to reveal, to unravel, to show something. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, remember, um, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Um, you know, in God's eyes, shortly coming to pass is like a day or two. To us, it's a long, long time. But to an eternal God, eh, it's like a day or two, you know? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it uh, by his angel unto his servant, John. You know, according to legend, John was the only apostle that didn't die for his faith. Yeah. Uh, according to legend, they tried to kill John and they couldn't do it. And that's why they banished him to the Isle of Patmos <laughs> to keep him from stirring up trouble. Yeah, we don't want you telling people about Jesus, so we're going to stick you on the Isle of Patmos. They tried to kill him, from, from what I understand, and they couldn't do it. And uh, so, verse 2. And signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, this was, uh, from what I understand, what they call today Asia Minor. These are in the area of Turkey. Uh, Turkey used to be called Greece until the Ottoman Turks, the Muslims, came and invaded and uh, slaughtered all the Christians. And then they renamed it Turkey. Matter of fact, their capital, Istanbul, used to be called Constantinople. That's those uh, peace-loving Muslims that they're uh, flooding Europe with. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, the modern demon nominational churches will tell you that these are periods of time, that each of these churches cover a period of time. You know, there might, but these were actual, literal, real churches that existed. Now, you got to realize there were periods in history when the church had characteristics that resembled one of these particular churches. And, you know, you got to look at it that way. But these were actual, literal churches. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, 
and from the seven spirits, and from the seven spirits, which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Uh, sorry, that's not the watchtower. That's not the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the faithful witness. No. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Does this sound like fake, a fake book that doesn't belong in the Bible? That's what some people are telling you. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Dominion, that is the root word means, uh, one of the root words is like dominion, dominate. Okay, seven. Behold, he cometh with clouds. I did an entire Bible study on clouds. It's on my playlist. You know, if, if, if we're not caught up in the air to see Christ in the clouds, it's the wrong Messiah. Believe me. Believe me. That is a very important thing. Almost all the world is going to go after the beast and the false prophet, especially when they start doing miracles. And uh, all these Christians that think that they're not going to be here and, and they're not going to have to die for their faith, uh, they're going to be sadly disappointed. They're going to fall away and they're going to say, you know what, I didn't sign up for this. Well, Jesus said, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Jesus said that uh, if you lost your life for him in the gospel's sake, you would be saved. And I'm paraphrasing here. But I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, you know, I don't want to teach the Bible. I, I enjoy just learning. But I know that every word that I teach, I'm going to have to give an account before the Lord one day. And that, my friends, is a scary thought. That if I'm teaching falsehood, I'm going to have to give an account. If I was deceived, that's one thing. But to do it on purpose? Oh boy, I'll tell you what. All these TV preachers, I have no sympathy for these people. None. Zero. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Oh yeah, those that drove the nails through his hands, the man that, uh, the Roman centurion or the, or the temple soldier uh, that put the spear in his side, they're going to see him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Jesus speaking, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last alphabet. The last letter of the Greek alphabet. And there are those in the Hebrew root that will tell you that, no, this is wrong. No, it's the Aleph Tav, which is the, the first letter and the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, there's 5,000 Greek manuscript pieces of the New Testament. There are zero of the Hebrew. These people want you to think that the New Testament was written in Hebrew and then mistranslated into Greek. Wrong. Wrong. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. That's trouble, people. And companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos 
for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why was he there? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you got the testimony of Jesus Christ, you're going to have tribulation, trouble. Trust me, I know. Been there, done that, didn't even get a t-shirt. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, words of Christ, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, actual, literal, existing churches, people, not periods of time. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus. Guess what, people? Paul wrote a book called Ephesians. That was one of the churches. Unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Philadelphia is where they... Um, is one of those Greek words that has reference to love. Phileo. And verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. Ah, here we go, golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Who is this? This is Christ, people. Verse 14. His head, his head, and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Sorry, black Hebrews. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Oh, I guess he was an albino, huh? He was an albino uh, African. Yeah. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, I always thought his eyes were red, like, you know, an albino. albino. But you know what? How many of you have gas stoves? When you light that gas stove, what color is the flame? Blue. I wonder if Jesus had blonde hair, you know, white as wool, as white as snow, and blue eyes. I don't know. Either way. And his feet like unto fine brass. Do you know what color brass is? Brass is a golden brown. You take a blonde-haired, blue-eyed surfer guy out in California that spends all the time in the sun surfing. What color is his skin? Golden brown. Brown, bl brass is not black. I'm sorry, black Hebrews, it's not. You're wrong. And they'll tell you that, well, you know, the, the white man stole our Bible and mistranslated it and turned it into a white man's book. Yeah, right. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the voice of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Here's the punchline, people. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The candlesticks, people. The seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. 
Sometimes when the Bible talks about stars, they're talking about things up in the heavens that burn, like our sun. But other times they're talking about angels. Read Job chapter 38. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Ah, did you know churches have stars? They have angels? Wow. And the seven candlesticks and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The candlesticks. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Christ is the light of the world. We're supposed to be in him. We're supposed to be the light of the world. And the churches are the candlesticks. They're supposed to be the light of the world too. Does that make sense? It does to me. So in the Old Testament, God alone was to be the light. But in the New Testament, those that are in Christ are to shine forth his light. I mean, you know, think about it. In the Old Testament, we didn't have the the very very few people had the holy spirit in the old testament uh, very very few uh, the prophets had the holy spirit and uh, you know people like king david had the holy spirit but it was very very limited very different than what it is today now in revelation 2 5 uh, they speaking to one of the churches says remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works so evidently this was a church that was doing well but fell and the Lord tells them to repent and there are those that will tell you that repent just means to change your mind to go from unbelief to belief and it has nothing to do with uh, turning from sin but the thing is you know they're talking to a church here that believes so what are they repenting from their unbelief no how can a church repent of its unbelief no he says remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. In other words, they weren't doing what they were in the beginning. They fell. But he warns, Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I don't, this is, to me, is a scary verse. This, when I read this, I look at this and think, Wow, can one lose their salvation well you don't lose it you know you might lose your car keys uh, but this sounds like they threw their salvation they were in danger of throwing their salvation away there's a difference between losing something and throwing something away uh, but that's a whole nother matter I mean I know there's people that will say oh well you you know once you're saved that's that's it you can't lose it. They make some good arguments, but when I read this, yeah, that's that's important. I don't know. All right, let's go back to Zechariah. All right, let's start at the beginning, Zechariah chapter 4. Yeah, I know. I'm long-winded. What can I tell you? And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is awakened, uh, that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold. We're going to cover gold. And a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Now here's the punchline. And two olive trees by it. One upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, the olive tree was symbolic of Israel. It was 
their national symbol of, of a tree. Uh, I guess we should take a look, huh? In Psalms 52 and verse 8, But I am like a green olive tree in, in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Huh. Very interesting, huh? All right, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. His vineyard. What vineyard? Uh, my well-beloved have a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. You know what? I was, uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Isaiah covers where uh, Israel is compared to grapes and a vineyard and wine, you know, just like when Jesus compared the drinking of his blood at the Last Supper to wine. But that's not what I was trying to prove. I'm trying to prove Israel being called, you know, likened to olives. Now, another thing, too, is uh, olive oil was likened unto the Holy Spirit. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 11. Now, Jeremiah is a, a book of judgment against his people for being disobedient and basically doing uh, Satanism. Jeremiah eleven thirteen, For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, gods, plural, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal, or Baal, which was a false god. Therefore, um, in verse 14, remember, this is what God's telling Jeremiah. Therefore, pray not for uh, thou for this people. Don't pray for these people. I mean, can you imagine that? God told Jeremiah, don't you pray for these people. Therefore, pray not thou for this people. L neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. Oh boy. You know what? The, when the ark was built, Noah's ark, when it was built, when God closed the door, that was it. The door was closed. It ain't opening up anymore. And God's slamming the door shut right here. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many? His people, Israel, the church, wrought lewdness. You know what lewdness men means? Wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh, the holy flesh. If there's holy flesh, there has to be unholy flesh, people. And the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. Yeah, they rejoice when they do the evil things that the God hates. Verse 16, here's the punchline. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree. A green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, hath he kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. See, Israel, olive tree. 17. For the Lord of hosts hath planted thee, hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal, or Baal. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou showest me their doings. That's right. Don't you dare pray for these people. I've had it. All right, so. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 3. And two olive trees by it. 
upon one, uh, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side thereof, Israel and Judah. Verse 4, So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings crying, Grace, grace unto it. You see the the uh, olive trees. The olive tree was to be um, a mystery, and we're going to go into it a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, matter of fact, let's stop right here and go take a look. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months." And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, these are the two witnesses of God that are going to uh, confront the beast and the false prophet. Okay? And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So, this thousand two hundred and sixty days is it's 42 months. Verse 4. Here's the punchline. These are the two olive trees. These two witnesses are, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth, proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, one of these is Elijah. I did a one hour and 40 minute study on Elijah. He's going to be one of these two witnesses. And no, their mouth is not a flamethrower. No. They speak with their mouth and call fire down from the sky and devours their enemies, just like in the book of, the, uh, book of Kings. I don't remember if it's 1 Kings or 2 Kings. But um, King Ahab, a wicked, evil king that God really hated, um, and he hated, and Ahab hated God too. He was married to a lovely wife named Jezebel. Does that ring a bell? Jezebel, ring a bell. Okay, I know. Don't quit my uh, day job. I won't be on uh, any comedy shows on television anytime soon. I'm sure. But uh, Ahab hated God, and God hated Ahab because he was evil. But he sent some soldiers to. To get Elijah, because he was at mad at Elijah, because Elijah said there is not going to be any rain. There's going to be a famine, and it didn't rain for years. I think like three years, three, three and a half, something like that. And uh, you know, crops have a hard time growing when there's no rain. So Elijah spoke the word. Fire came down from heaven, devoured fifty soldiers. Ahab sent 50 soldiers to collect one guy, Elijah, and, uh, and a captain. So I guess there was 51. So fire burned him up. Guess what? King Ahab sent another 50 and one. Happened again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's why you need to read the Old Testament, because it ties into the New Testament. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. 
These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, just like in the book of Kings, and have power over waters to turn them the blood, just like in the days of Moses, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Christ crucified? You know what makes me angry? People will tell you that this great city is Rome, and the Vatican. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, those people that tell you that this is the Vatican and Rome, ask them, what is the name of your Lord? Because it's surely not Jesus who is Christ. Absolutely not, because Jesus was not crucified in Rome. He was crucified in Jerusalem, which is called, spiritually, Sodom and Egypt. Oh, yeah. And then they'll try to argue with you and say, well, you know, the Romans crucified Jesus, and that's why it's called this. No, where also our Lord was crucified, not uh, by whom our Lord was crucified. No, not by whom the Lord was crucified, Rome. No, where also, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and, and a half and shall not suffer or allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Sounds like Christmas, huh? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. All right, let's go back to Zechariah. All right, let's go to, let's see, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel hath laid the foundation of this house. What house? The house of the Lord, the temple. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. These are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. I think the seven eyes are indicative of the seven angels. Didn't we read that? I think what? In Revelation 11? Or was it Revelation 1? The seven spirits for the seven churches? Uh, verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees? Ah, Upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again, and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Now remember, oil. And why is it golden? Um, really fine quality olive oil is golden colored. Um, oil... Uh, oil is oftentimes indicative of the Holy Spirit, right? And they call these candlesticks, but back in the old days, they were uh, they used olive oil for their lamps. Olive oil burns, people. You know, we should burn with the Holy Spirit. Um. What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? 
And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones. Remember, in the Old Testament, they would take the king and anoint their head with olive oil, which was indicative of the Lord giving him um, the Holy Spirit. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Didn't we just read in uh, Revelation about the two witnesses? One of them is going to be Elijah. Let's prove that. All right, let's go to Malachi chapter 4. Verse 1. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, a minor prophet. Verse 1. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. What's stubble? Something that you don't want to... Stubble's just like... Something that you burn. It's like uh, little twigs. And all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise. Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked. Ooh, I like this. For they shall be ashes. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with my statutes and judgments. Behold, here's the punchline, listen carefully. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. For the believers, it's going to be a great day, but for the wicked, it's going to be a dreadful day. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, some people will tell you that John the Baptist was Elijah. Well, was he? Let's take a look. Well, the answer to that is in John chapter 1, starting in verse 19. And this is the record of John. This is John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied now, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. John knew who he was and who he wasn't. Now, uh, Zacharias was the father of John the Baptist. Elizabeth was the mother. And Eli uh, Zacharias was a priest that served in the temple of God. We read about him in Luke chapter 1 uh, and verse 11. All right, so Zacharias is doing the Lord's work here. Verse 11, John, Luke chapter 1, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. I mean, if, 
if he was Elijah, they'd have called him Elijah. But no, his name's going to be called John. And thou, sh and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong, strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah. And he shall go before them, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, the Greek rendering of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he, John came in the spirit, in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the spirit and power of Elijah. He wasn't Elijah. So one of these two witnesses is going to be Elijah. The second one, people argue over. I did a Bible study on it, if anybody's interested. Uh, some people say the second witness will be Moses, because at the transfiguration of Jesus, there was Elijah and Moses. Elijah was representative of the prophets. Elijah, yeah, was indicative of the prophets, and Moses was indicative of the law. Let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun. Wow. His face is shining like the sun. And his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses, the law, and Elias, Elijah, the Greek rendering, the, uh, who represents the prophets, talking with him. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us Make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and and." And be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? Elijah, why do, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Ah, see, John the Baptist came in the power of Elias, Elijah. Now, Moses was the law, Elijah was the prophets. Remember that. Now, in Matthew 22, verse 33, 36, Somebody asked, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, 
thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, Moses had died. Elijah never did. Elijah was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire. Maybe we should take a look at that. That's why he's coming back. All right, let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, and it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. Uh, Beth means house, and El has reference to God. So basically, Bethel means house of God. And uh, so Elijah, um, from what I understand, Elijah means um, Yah is God. And I'm not sure about El, Elisha, uh, has some kind of reference to God. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But, um, and Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets, which uh, that were at Bethel, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Hold ye your peace. Uh, in other words, oh yeah, I know it. Be quiet. Verse 4. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophet, prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided thither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. Just like uh, Moses did with the Red Sea, right? When Israel crossed, when Pharaoh's army was, uh, the Egyptian army was going to follow them. Hmm. And it came to pass when they were gone over, uh, verse 9, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. In other words, uh, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grant you a wish. What do you want? Well, that's kind of my take on it. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now, Elijah had a lot of, he was a very, you know, he did the Lord's work. The Lord gave him a lot of his power. And Elisha's wanting double. <laughs> I mean, talk about being greedy. No, not really. You know, I'm just saying. But he wanted double what Elijah had. Verse 10, And he, Elijah, said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Oh boy, do you know what you're asking? Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. So if you see me take, taking off, your wish is granted, your request has been honored. But if not, sorry, Charlie, only the best tuna gets to be sarcist. Verse 11. Now here's the punchline. And it came, came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, 
there appeared a chariot of fire, a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah never died, people. Verse 12. And Elisha saw it. Oh yeah, you're, you want double? You're going to get it. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he... I'm sorry, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters, and he said, Where is the God? Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on the Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, there was only two people that never died in the Bible. Elijah was one of them. Elijah's coming back. He's going to be one of the two witnesses. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. Ah, Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. Hmm. Uh, three hundred and sixty-five. How many days are in a year? Three hundred and sixty-five. How many years did he live? Uh, well, how many days of e uh, all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty-five years? And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God took him. So, is Enoch going to be one of the two witnesses? Wouldn't surprise me. I think I think it's going to be Elijah and Enoch because they're the only two that have never died. But if you want to think Moses, uh, it's possible. I mean, Moses was dead, but yet he was transfigured before Jesus. So, all right. Well, uh, let's see. All right. I mentioned that gold is indicative of God. But uh, those that are redeemed in Christ are indicative of silver. All right, let's take a quick look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. That was John, right? And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. What's a refiner's fire? Well, when you are into metallurgy, for example, when you're taking gold ore, uh, there's gold in the rocks, but there's impurities in there. So what you do is you take a fire and you build, uh, put it in a pot, uh, a metal pot, and you melt it. And then the either the uh, whatever you're trying to purify will either be on the top or on the bottom. If it's on the top, you scrape, you separate the stuff that's on the top and make it separate from the impurities. Or if the impurities are on the top, you skim that off. I, gold is heavier than most things. So that's why when they panned for gold, the gold would be on the bottom and then they, the stuff that was lighter would they sift off off the top. Well, if, they're, if you're refining gold, the impurities are going to be on the top when you melt it. 
so the uh, the gold will be on the bottom. I'm not sure how it works with silver. I'm not I'm not into metallurgy, but I'm just saying that's what it's. They're talking about a refiner's fire. You ever heard of a refinery? They're trying to purify something. They're trying to separate it. For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. All right, let's close this out. Luke chapter 6, uh, I guess verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did they, did their fathers unto the prophets. Oh yeah. So leap for joy, people, and rejoice in that day. Just remember something. It's going to be bad for the wicked, but it's going to be the day of the Lord's going to be salvation for his people. Keep that in mind. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.